Okay, greetings and welcome. North High School freshmen, North alumni, Scabo High School, and members of the North Side and Greater Des Moines community. My name is Praveen Banakati. I'm the school improvement leader here at North High School. And on behalf of the administration and our staff and our students, we welcome you. The program you'll be hearing today is a very special one, and we want to thank the Iowa Jewish Historical Society for making it possible. Today, we have the unique opportunity to hear one of the last living survivors from Schindler's List, Selena Benitez. A little background about Selena before I let her take over. She was an eight-year-old attending elementary school when the Germans invaded Poland, and only 13 when her name and that of her parents were added to Oskar Schindler's list of 1,100 Jewish laborers whose lives he would eventually save. Three years later, she arrived in Des Moines and entered North High School. In between, she faced Dr. Joseph Mengele, the busher of Auschwitz, and was one of the few people who convinced him to let her live. Selena frequently says, Oscar and Emily Schindler gave her a second chance at life, and Steven Spielberg gave her a voice. It is truly an honor and a privilege to hear that voice today. Please join me in welcoming our fellow polar bear and Wall of Fame member, Selena Binias. I don't know whether to say, can you hear me? Okay, I don't know whether to say good afternoon or what, but I am a Holocaust survivor and every survival is unique. My uniqueness is that I was on Schindler's List and additional uniqueness is that I'm a graduate of North High School. <laughs> Before I go on though, I'm a, I have to make tribute to the people who did not survive. The Nazis unfortunately got rid of 11 million people during the Second World War. Six million were Jews, but there were five other million people who were annihilated. Those people were clergy, political prisoners, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Roma, that's the gypsies, and anybody else uh, who did not fit the Aryan idea. So I always think of the people who didn't make it. My second chance on life came with my liberation from Oscar Schindler's factory. On May 9th, 1945. But prior to that, the war in Europe ended on May 8th and 7th. But we were not liberated till May 9th, and I'll tell you about it a little later. Mr. Schindler and Mrs. Schindler saved us because we were on the list. Mrs. Schindler, by foraging all over Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Brunitz, the area in Moravia, collecting rutabagas and all kinds of winter vegetables to be put into the meager soup that was fed to the prisoners. So we felt we had to pay him them back. We knew that if the Russians who are going to liberate us were going to meet up with Mr. Schindler, they were going to kill them both because, after all, Mr. Schindler was a Nazi to begin with. So we decided to do something nice for him. He called us onto the main floor 
to say goodbye to us. He was actually in tears, telling us that he only wished he could have saved more people, but he did run out of money. He was a complete pauper by the time the war ended. Some of the men in the men's section removed their gold fillings uh, and gave them to a goldsmith who was part of the prison, who made it into a ring for Mr. Schindler. It's a little gold band. Inside the band is an inscription in Hebrew that says, he who saves one saves the world entire. Then what we did was put striped pajamas, you know, the outfits that the prisoners wore on them, got two young men from camp to drive their car into the American zone, feeling that that would save them because these people were going to explain to the Americans just what Mr. Schindler did for the 1,100 people that he kept safe. At the same time, the factory was, when he took it over, it was a munitions factory, and we were working on items for V2, the rockets that were shelling London. But Mr. Schindler told us to sabotage everything that we had there. And we set up the calibrators in such a way that they showed we were producing correct items, but the correct items were shaved off by one millimeter or two millimeters. So nothing left that factory that was of any use for the Wehrmacht, for the German army. The factory that he took over was a factory of cloth. And there was still some stuff left over from prior owners. Mr. Schindler decided that each family should have two bolts of cloth and five pairs of scissors because we could use those items to barter for lodging and food and otherwise. Uh, we had no money at all. So this would have come in handy. The reason I mention that is that we did barter away four pairs of scissors, but one pair of scissors survived, and it's right there on the table, and I'm going to allow you to come back after the, if there is time, of course, to take a look at them, all right? Those scissors were in a concentration camp, so they're kind of unique, too. The liberation from camp came on May, on May 9th by the Russian army. Prior to our liberation, the Yalta Agreement said that American forces were going to liberate Germany, but Russian forces were going to liberate Czechoslovakia. The Germans made it in time, I mean, the Americans made it in time, but the Russian army was very slow because they had truly had to walk all the way up to Moravia. So they didn't appear till the 9th, and it was on the 9th that we were finally liberated. I was the youngest female on Schindler's list. I was 13 years old and I, w I weighed about 35 kilos, which you translate into almost a little over 70 pounds. We just started walking back to Krakow. The Czech government gave us wonderful protection, gave us our documents, and they are right there, you can look at them asking the Czech people to be helpful with supplies of food, clothing, etc. And to make, and the document also proves the fact that we were liberated from a concentration camp, and thus we were concentration camp prisoners. The way we, lo the way we looked, bedraggled, 
shaved heads and all of that definitely showed us to be Katzetniks. And that was the word used because the German word for a concentration camp, a shortened one, was called KZ. And so people who were in the camps were called Katzetniks. This is the pass that the Czech people or Czech government produced for us. So you can also see it over here. When we got to Krakow, we had two priorities. One priority was to find the family, notify the Red Cross to let people on the outside know that we as a family have survived. That meant my uncle, my father's brother, who lived in Des Moines, Iowa, and also another uncle who lived in Palestine. We also notified the Jewish Organization of Survivors to, know, to find, to look, and see if any of our family survived. Second priority was my education. I had finished second grade, but five and a half years later, I had no education at all. And I felt very embarrassed and when you are denied something, you crave it like crazy. I know that most of you now are thinking of a test or a paper that you have to do and you dread it. But believe me, if that had been denied to you for five years, you would be craving it, wanting to go to school, wanting to learn. So some of the stuff that we had for bartering allowed us to hire a tutor to fill in the gaps in my education. I could read, but I could not write. I hadn't had a pencil in my hand for all those years. I worked on machineries, but that was it. And uh, to be able to take the exams in, before September, to be able to get into the school, which was called the gymnasium, I was of the age where I was supposed to go to either middle school or high school, but certainly not elementary school. I did take the exams, I passed them, and was allowed to go into the high school. Uh, the high schools in Poland were segregated. There was a girls' high school and a boys' high school. Only two Jewish kids made it into the girls' high school while I was one of those Jewish girls. I was thrilled. For the first time in September, I was in a class with young people just like me and actually learning things, which was wonderful, but it didn't last very long. By the end of September, there was another pogrom. In case you don't know what a pogrom is, it's an insurrection against the Jews. And it was in the eastern part of Poland. And my parents decided that with this new virulent anti-Semitism sprouting up, they weren't going to stay in Poland. And by the end of the summer, we had already heard from my uncle in Des Moines that he was going to work out to, on some affidavits and he was going to bring us to the United States. So we knew we had a place to go to eventually, so we left Poland. The borders were closed, so we had to bribe a D Russian soldier and in his truck at night we crossed over the border between Poland and Czechoslovakia. We ended up in Bratislava, which at this point is the capital of Slovakia, but at that time it was part of Czechoslovakia. We traversed the area through Prague towards the German border because we were planning to cross over the border into the American zone. In the American zone, for the first two weeks, we stayed at a displaced persons camp, 
But my parents decided, particularly my mother, she said, we've had enough camp living. And so they opted to go to a small German town on, and live on Russian cards and United Nations relief packages. And those packages were wonderful because in them were such items as coffee, chocolate, soap, uh, not that we were going to use it, but they proved to be excellent items to barter against the German teachers who were going to now teach me again. Again, I couldn't go to school because I didn't know German. One of the teachers turned out to be, in this small town, there was a semi-cloister, which means that the nuns never left it, but the children went into the cloister for education. In this particular cloister was a nun, 90 years old, a retired English teacher, and she was going to teach me German and English. I needed to learn the English in order to come to the United States. Mother Leontine, that was her name, entered the convent when she was 16 years old. She was now 90. She had never left the convent. She knew nothing of Hitler's propaganda. She knew nothing about what the Nazis did on the outside. She was the person who was able to work with me to accept me completely as a human being. She was the first person that I met that looked upon me at the age of 14 and said, this is just a girl that needs help. You know, she was German and she was Catholic, but she, and she was supposed to hate me, but she knew nothing of that. She's the one that worked with me. I worked with her for two years. She's the one that helped me get through anger and bitterness. She's the one that taught me that hatred is corrosive and that you have to work through hatred in order to move forward. And that's the session, uh, that's the part that I want to bring to all of you. That is what moves you forward. Okay, we get affidavits after two years. We now have to go to Munich, to the American consulate to pick up our permits for travel. And on the street in Munich, we should meet up with, with Oskar Schindler. It was such an unusual meeting. He is delighted to see us go to the United States because his aim has always been to save families because he felt you save a family, there is hope for further generations. We go on a ship to the United States. It is a troop ship, the SS C. Marlin. It's a troop ship that hasn't been decommissioned as yet. It is made up of two huge cabins, one cabin for men, one cabin for women. The cabin holds 60 people, and it is filled with hammocks, five hammocks in a row, I mean, in line, so that you have to slide into them in order to sleep. That's what the soldiers did, and that's what we did. It's a rough vo uh, voyage. Lots of people get sick. It's 11 and a half days. I am not sick, and I eat everybody's ice cream. We travel, my uncle drives to New York. We land in New York, my uncle comes to New York, drives there with his car and my aunt. It's the first time we meet him, of course. And then he takes us, drives us to Des Moines. It was wonderful to see the vastness of the United States. I had no idea how vast the US was. As soon as we get into the United uh, into Des Moines, 
My uncle takes me to North High School, the old North High School, and I present to the faculty and the administration. Fortunately, I brought all my notebooks with me and all the books and everything that I had done for the two years in Germany. And they take a look at it. I, I took math, Latin, science, all kinds of courses with various German teachers, all Nazis, and all who accepted the chocolate very gratefully from a Jewish girl. So I show it to the uh, education people here at North High. They decide that I have covered enough material that I could go into 12th grade. From second to 12th, I had never been in school. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? To be able to skip so many grades. So, uh, but they say that I have to cover uh, American history and American literature. So I go to, probably your enemy, to East High School for during the summer to cover American history and American literature. My year at North High School was the most wonderful year in my life. For the first time, I had friends, I had good teachers, I was accepted as a human being, I did the fun things that teenagers usually do, and it was just an incredible relief. It made me appreciate where I was. I was so grateful to the Des Moines community for accepting us and giving us this new possibility in life. The girls' advisor, and I'm sure you probably don't have that anymore here in North High, but we did. The girls' advisor was a graduate of Grinnell College, and she made it her aim to take me to Grinnell because she thought I should go to that college. She took me to Grinnell, she drove me there, produced my grades, and uh, all the things that I have taken, convinced Grinnell to give me an academic scholarship and then a work program for the next four years for my uh, B&B, okay? Four years in Grinnell were wonderful. I was in the freshman class of 1948 because I graduated from your school in 1948. You know, I still keep hear from some people who are in my class. And I happened to meet a couple people in Des Moines yesterday who actually came up just to say hello because they were in my Latin class, interestingly enough. I'm going to telescope the years of 1952. I graduated from uh, Grinnell in 52. I uh, went on to New York. I got a scholarship at Columbia University where I got my teaching certificate. I continued teaching. Uh, I got married. I had two children. And I taught for 27 years elementary school. I worked with the youngsters who had slight difficulty learning because I could certainly identify with them what it was like to do it in that way. My community where I lived, which was on Long Island outside of New York, had no idea uh, that I was a Holocaust survivor. First of all, the word Holocaust did not come into usual language till about 1967. Prior to that time, we were known as DPs, displaced persons. We had come from Europe, but we could not go back to our countries because either the countries were occupied by a foreign power, as Poland was by Russia, Czechoslovakia was by Russia, or other reasons. Uh, so 
That's what we were known. We were known as DPs. Not even my children knew that I was a Holocaust survivor. They only knew that I had been in Europe and came to the United States in 1947. So, something happened here, something is missing, but I want to tell you what happened. In 1982, I was reading the New York Times, I opened the section that said, uh, book review, and there on the front page of the book review section was the story, a review of a book, Schindler's List. I practically jumped out of my seat because that was the story of my life right there in front of me. I quickly called my mother, told her to please buy the book, and then I bought the book and read it and found it extremely accurate. The name of Leopold Page was mentioned several times in the book as that he was the one that got Mr. Keneally to know the Schindler story. Schindler was very well known in Israel because a lot of people there that he moved to Israel uh, who were former prisoners in his camp, people that he saved. So. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Alley of the Righteous at Yad Vashem, which is the uh, Holocaust Museum in Israel, there is a tree planted in the third place from the front, which means that he was honored a long, long time, knowing that he has helped 1100, saved 1,100 people. He's definitely, but nobody knew about Schindler here or in Europe or any place else in the world. It wasn't till I don't know what's happening here. Okay. So in nineteen eighty four we were on a visit to Los Angeles. We knew Leopold Page from camp and other places. So we decided to go and visit him, how to find out in his shop in Beverly Hills, to find out how did Mr. Keneally find out about us on Schindler's List. What we found out was that Mr. Keneally was at a conference at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. His portfolio broke a handle. He asked where he could have it repaired. Mr. Leopold Page had a shop, leather goods shop. The hotel gave him the address. Mr. Kennedy walks in, notices that Mr. Page has an accent, asks him about, you know, where are you from? Mr. Page starts telling him the story, and then he asks Mr. Kinley, uh, who are you? And Mr. Kinley says, well, I'm Australian. I'm a writer. I'm here for a conference. To which Mr. Page says, have I got a story for you? And tells him the entire story. Brings all the papers that he's been collecting. Mr. Kinley takes a year, really, to go all around to talk to various people who have been on the Schindler's List to find out if what, is read, what Mr. Page told him is correct. Then he writes the book, and the book, that was in 1981. The book publishes in 1982. Universal Studios takes an option on the book, which means they were going to make a film out of it. My son happens to be working for Universal, is in the room when they are discussing making a movie out of Schindler's List. <laughs> My son calls me up and says, you won't believe it, Mom, but they want to make a movie out of Schindler's List. I said, you got to be crazy. How could you ever make a movie of a concentration camp and expect it to sell, you know, or how could you do it? They do, 
by the option for Steven Spielberg to do the film. At that point, Steven's her, Steven Spielberg had just issued E.T. If any of you have seen E.T., you know it, it certainly is not about concentration camps or anything. It's a whimsical, wonderful film. He waits almost 10 years to start making the film. He goes to Poland. This is Mr. Page. This is Mr. Page and myself, at a much younger age, visiting him. Mr. Uh, <coughs> Steven Spielberg goes to Poland to start filming the film. People come up to him and tell him all kinds of survival stories. He decides at that point that he should collect all of these stories of the survivors before all these survivors die off. So he takes the $50 million that was his personal take from the movie and starts the Shoah, founds the Shoah Foundation, which then pro proceeds to collect 56,000 interviews in 30 different languages, provides the translations into many languages. For example, I gave my deposition in 1996, and it is translated in several languages. I know that somebody in the Free University in Berlin can pick out my story, and it will be in German. There are translations, as I said. They're all digitalized, and now they are, the archives are plant, planted in may, may, many institutions of learning, about like almost 100 all over the world, universities, teaching institutions, etc., so that people, the beauty of it is that it's an incredible teaching tool. You can actually look and read a book about the Holocaust. You can go to a museum and look at the artifacts of the Holocaust. But nothing speaks to you like the human voice talking directly to you when you're sitting at your computer. The human voice has a way of penetrating, of making a connection. When somebody talks to you about their experiences, whether in a concentration camp, or being hidden in a bunker, or being hidden in a Catholic seminary, it makes a huge difference. And that is what the Shoah Foundation is doing. That's the way of teaching people to overcome hatred. The permanent home is at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Right now, they are working on the Armenian genocide, on the Rwandan genocide, on Cambodian, Guatemalan. In other words, they're interviewing people who have survived that and how they survived it. And the Nanjing massacre, which happened by the Japanese in China. So that was the movie in 1993. And Mr. and Steven Spielberg felt there was no need to review, renew the movie or to make another movie or anything like that. But in the, particularly in the film community, there were so many deniers that the Holocaust ever happened that he decided to put out a DVD. It was released on the 10th anniversary of the film in 1993. 
No, that couldn't be. Sorry, in 2003. In 2003, and what he did, the film is on one side of the DVD, and on the back side of the DVD uh, is something called Voices from the List. He has several of us telling our story of what happened with Schindler so that this is a permanent record. As long as the DVD is produced, it will be there. It will not, cannot be denied because these are actual people who have gone through it. And I was invited to the event, met with Stephen, had a talk with him, and told him in no uncertain terms that Oscar Schindler definitely saved my life. But he, by re producing the movie, gave me a voice. I had never spoken about my experiences before because there was no point of reference. Uh, how could I talk about what it was like to be on Schindler's List, what it was like to be in a concentration camp, unless somebody knew about it, knew a little bit more about it. So he really did open me up and allowed me to give some information. I really have to watch the time. I, I tend to run on. So he gave me life and voice. Um, let's see, what else do we have? This is the event. There's Steven Spielberg with some of the people who are on the voice from, voices from the list. That happens to be me at the edge there. Schindler's personality was such, he was such a gambler, such a risk taker, such an interesting person. He uh, wanted to make money and all of that. We would have never thought that this man would have the epiphany that he did, just trying to dis you know, make the decision that he was going to save 1,100 people. Well, incredibly unusual, very different from what he was at the beginning of his time in Poland from 1940 or so to uh, the end of it in 1945. He gets the factory as spoils of war, gets his camp workers. It's a safe haven, as I told you before, because he bribed the commandant and allowed his workers to stay there. But as the Russian started to advance on Krakow in 1944, towards the end of 1944, he decides to move the factory to Czechoslovakia. And as I said, gets the permission from the commandant to take 1,100 workers to that new factory, which is going to be a munitions factory. The camp is being liquidated. Eight hundred men and three hundred women. He makes up a list. I think I'm just going to stop right here and tell you about what happened, uh, because that's not on the PowerPoint. And if I have time later, I'll show you more pictures. What happened was that the eight hundred camp was being liquidated. The eight hundred men were put into boxcars and sent off to che supposedly Czechoslovakia. And we, of course, didn't know anything about what, what was happening. But, uh, had no, no knowledge whether the men actually ended uh, or not. Now, what happened next was two weeks later, 300 women were put into the boxcars. Day and a half of travel, we were sure it was middle of the night. We were sure we were landing when the uh, train stopped. We were sure we were landing in Czechoslovakia. Doors open, slid open, 
and all of a sudden we hear all kinds of noises, dogs barking, Germans shouting, the sky, it's night, the sky is illuminated with fire plumes, there's an awful f smoke everywhere, and an awful smell, and we realize that we have just gotten into Auschwitz, that we cannot understand how come we were supposed to go to Czechoslovakia. Well, they tell us to get off the boxcars, they march us into a bunker, tell us to strip, take off all our clothes, then we go through and some barbers, female barbers, start cutting our hair. If they didn't like you, they shaved your head completely. If you were somewhat sympathetic, they only cut bits and pieces of it. Then they move us to another room where the sign on top says sauna, and sauna means bath in German. That's pronounced sauna. And all of a sudden the door's closed. We are all naked. We look up and they are the shower heads. And we don't know whether gas, is, by 19, end of 1944 almost, we all knew that Auschwitz was an extermination camp. So we don't know what's gonna happen. We look, it's a moment of extreme panic. You, we feel that this is our last day on earth. And then all of a sudden, water comes down. And it's such a relief, you can't imagine, because we can feel that we have another day of life given to us. They open the doors on the other side of the showers. We are put into another barrack, given striped clothes, the striped pajamas like, and wooden clogs, and we never see any of the clothes that we left behind. This is it. We are now prisoners of Auschwitz. We are walked to our barracks, 300 women, three barracks, each barrack 100 people. We are given, we are told to get on our berth. The berth holds five people. You know what a berth is, right? Wooden platform like. And uh, we're told to, uh, you know, so the only way you can fit five people on a berth like that is if somebody's feet are in my face and my feet are in somebody else's face. And when you have to turn, everybody turns. That way we live for about, uh, well, we are in Auschwitz now for about five to five and a half weeks to six weeks. But our duties during that, and we still don't know why we are there or what happened. Our duties are to clean the barracks, clean the latrines, to go through uh, to shovel snow, and every so often a group of women is taken to the kitchen to peel potatoes for our meager soup. One day like that, my mother volunteers, I was always with my mother, my mother volunteers to take, to go with a group of women to peel potatoes so that maybe she can bring back a few peels so we would have a little extra food. It just so happens that on the particular day that she volunteers to go to the kitchen, that barrack is taken for selection. We are taken to another barrack, told to strip. We're completely naked, and we stand in a row in front of Dr. Mengele who has a pencil in his hand, and with that pencil, he moves it either to life or to death. The first time I go through the line, Dr. Mengele puts me on the death side. Terrible feeling, of course, frightening. Then, after he gets through with the whole group, he beckons the group that was no longer viable, to go in front of him again. Maybe we'll have another chance. And when I come in front of him, I honestly don't know 
what prompted it, but it must have been a very strong survival instinct. I am underdeveloped. I'm only 13. I'm skinny. I'm as tall as I am now. But my body is clean. I stand in front of him, and I say three words to him in German. Lassen Sie me, which means let me go. This time, the pencil moves on the life side. I run out, grab my clothes, and crying hysterically because the emotions were so pent up, I run out into the snow, which the, the other women are standing outside getting also dressed, and I realized that I had just been given a reprieve of knife from Dr. Mengele. When my mother comes back and realizes what has happened, she also cries hysterically. In years after, as I'm older and more mature, I often wondered what would have happened if my mother had been there? Would I have depended upon her to save me? I really don't know. It's an enigma. But it has taught me something. It has taught me that you cannot predict ever how you would act in any particular circumstance. Also, you cannot walk in another person's shoes. You really don't know what they would do. And to be less judgmental in other, of other people when they make their actions, because you never know what prompted them to do what they did. We are taken back to the barracks. Again, life continues the same way. And then one day, we are walked out of the barracks. By the way, we are counted every single day for two hours in the morning, for two hours in the afternoon, for two hours in the evening, standing on this, what they call appel pots, where they count you, and it's very cold. This is now November, and snow everywhere, and all we have is the clogs on our feet and the striped pajamas. We have no coats or anything like that. The barrack is then, take, all three barracks are just formed into a line and taken to, uh, to be tattooed. So now we think, okay, if they tattoo us, that means that we are permanent prisoners of Auschwitz. My number was A, which stands for Auschwitz, 74618. My mother's name was, my mother's number was the same, except it ended up in 19, alphabetically. But as we approach the barracks where we are supposed to be tattooed, all of a sudden the whole group is veered into another direction, taken to some boxcars, and told to quickly get into the boxcars. There we see Oscar Schindler, who had come in person, probably, which we found out later, with a large valise full of money to bribe the commandant to allow his 300 women to join him in the factory. And he got us out. You, we would have never left. So we are the 300 women who have gone through Auschwitz, the only 300 women who have gone through Auschwitz without tattoos on our arms. We end up in his factory get off the boxcars after two days and um, see the barbed wire. And behind the barbed wire, we see the men. This is the first time that we, see, we know that the men had made it to the place. And we are uh, delighted you know, to know that they are alive and well. They look at us, and they don't recognize us because we look so different. Some of us have shaven hearts. Some of us have incredible hairdos. And of course, we all look the same in our striped pajamas. We spend the time in 
with Oscar Schindler. And as I already told you before, he's very good to us. And he actually, you know, by the time we are liberated, he really say, we worked very hard. There's no question about it. And we are very hungry because there was very little food available at that point. This is the end of the war and the meager provisions everywhere. So now, I don't know how much time I have left. So <laughs> I don't want to hear the bells going. Huh? So do I have some time or not? Okay. Now I'm going to show you. I'll, I'll skip about... All right, I'll just quickly tell you, my family worked for Madridge, which is the sewing factory, which was in camp. We could not, you know, there was no reason not to move sewing machines into camp behind barbed wire. Schindler and Madridge are good friends. As I told you he put some of us on his list. Uh, uh, Madridge was so good that under the huge bales of fabric that were brought in to the factory to make, to make the uniforms. So it was kind of very heavy fabric, like Loden, you know. And uh, under the, these huge bales, he would bring in additional bread, medications, and all kinds of things that people needed. So there was, you know, smuggling in them. And that was very, very good. It helped a lot of people. I say you never know whether there was chance, good luck, or my fate to have survived. Now, this is the original uh, entrance to the factory in, in uh, Krakow. This was taken in 2006. There's a picture of Oskar Schindler with part of his story. And a memorial here mentioning the fact that if you save one life, you save the world entire. I was sitting at his actual desk. That is before this factory now became a museum in Poland. This is the new museum made out of this factory. And inside is a huge memorial to all the Schindler people. All the names are engraved on a piece of something that looks like gold, really. So it's very impressive. And on the outside of the entrance now, there are pictures, actual photographs, of the people that were still living and could produce photographs when the uh, museum was being built. It opened in 2010. And now in Krakow, which has become an incredible tourist destination, there's a little shuttle that goes to the original ghetto, to the Jewish section in Krakow, what used to be the Jewish section in Krakow, to the Schindler factory, and as a matter of fact, every summer, uh, as many as 10,000 people come to Krakow for a festival. Very interesting, isn't it? Life God does go on. This is my nun who gave me a life, really. Um, you can, see, you can see that right on the table. Oops, that is important. This is the Schindler, famous Schindler Cup. That is the cup that we had in our concentration camp. We drank out of those cups every morning. And my mother kept the cup all her life in the kitchen because she always said if anything was going wrong, all she had to do is look at the cup and say, there's a better tomorrow. The cup, by the way, is on display, as you can see, at the CASP gallery, sponsored by the Iowa Jewish Historical Society. 
And if some of you have not been, it makes a wonderful field trip for the students to go and see the incredible contributions from about 1800 that some of the Jews made to Iowa in the various, various uh, places. Some places that you wouldn't even think there was a Jew there before. So this is my presentation. You are welcome to come and see the uh, artifacts that are there. That is if you have the time. And I thank you for all your attention. Um, yeah, you're, you're good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, real quick, uh, stay seated, please. Stay, stay seated, stay seated. We're not going yet. Um, <laughs> does, does anybody have any questions? I know in your, in your polar bear time, you guys came up with some questions uh, for Selena. Does anybody want to ask their question at this point? Go ahead. What did it feel like to be free after all that time? Uh, when we were liberated, it was a very strange feeling. Strange in a sense that we were so used to always walking in rows of five, always with a German soldier with the uh, gun drawn, supervising us. So it was very unusual to be able to walk out by yourself. It was frightening, really, not knowing how to walk really alone. Uh, having been told for five and a half years what we are supposed to do, orders all the time, it was very difficult to figure out how can I think for myself? How can I plan anything for myself? It took a lot of adjusting after the war to be back to humanity. Any more? Go ahead. I, I really can't hear you. It just doesn't carry. Somebody can help me here. What? Well, I had an incredible par parents. My mother lost her entire family during the uh, war, but she was a very res resilient person and did not dwell on the things that happened, but rather her favorite motto was, the world owes you nothing, and you have to just do the best with whatever is available to you. Uh, I can't say that life was very easy for a while, uh, you know, but I worked through it. The nun helped me, my parents helped me, the acceptance of, for example, the school at North High School when I joined that class, the fact that all the kids were so nice to me, the fact that Grinnell College accepted me and helped me to uh, learn and to become who I am, all of those things were helpful. I'm grateful to the community and to all the people who allowed my parents to restore their life, to restore their dignity, to uh, make, allow them to be human beings again, and to allow me to be a human being again. All right, all right, give it up, give it up, give it up.
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have one last thing that we need to do uh, before uh, we go. And as all of you know, as a big part of being a polar bear and part of being the polar bear way is earning our challenge coins. And Selena, on behalf of North High School, the administration, our students, in appreciation for all you've been through and all that you are, we'd like to present you with our challenge coin and your own North High School polo. Everybody give it up for Ms. Benitez, please. <laughs> one more time, one more time, give it up. <laughs>